We're going to return to the toothpaste data set that we had previously. If you recall, we had 30 respondents on these six different questions. When we used cluster analysis, what we did was try to actually say, are there certain groupings of individuals so that we don't have to think about 30 different people? This time we're going to say, are there really six unique questions? Or are those six questions representing some fewer number of underlying constructs or factors? So let's take a look at how we do this in SPSS. Okay, so here's our data set. We've seen this before. This time, instead of cluster analysis, let's take a look at factor analysis. The way we do that is under Analyze, Dimension Reduction, Factor. We get this window, and the variables that we're going to use are V1 through V6, so we select those and move those over. Before we can actually do factor analysis, we have to test whether factor analysis can be performed. And there's three statistical checks that we need to see before we can actually proceed with factor analysis. SPSS doesn't by default provide these, so we have to ask for them. Under descriptives, we need to ask for the anti-image correlation matrix, as well as the KMO and Bartlett's test of sphericity. And I'll explain what those are as we see the results. We'll need to do other things when we actually run our factor analysis, but just for this first step of seeing if factor analysis is allowed, that's all we're going to need. So we do that and we click OK. So the first thing we see is this set of tests right here. The top line is the kaiser meyer olkin measure of sampling adequacy. What this basically is, is a statistic that indicates the proportion of variance in our variables that might be caused by underlying factors. In other words, it tells us if there's enough covariation among the variables themselves to allow for us to extract the factors that underlie factor analysis. The closer the value is to one, the greater the usefulness of something like factor analysis might be. As a rule of thumb for us, we say that we want a minimum KMO value of 0.6. And so this being 0.660, that meets our minimum requirement. If the value were lower than 0.6, we would have to say we cannot perform factor analysis in this particular data set, and it's, there's simply not enough variation that can be accounted for by underlying factors. A similar test is the Bartlett's test of sphericity, which is something that tests the null hypothesis, which is that the variables in the correlation matrix that we'll observe are not related. And so if we can reject this null hypothesis, we can conclude that in fact there is some relationship between our variables. So what we need is a significant result. This needs to be less than 0.05. It clearly is, and so we can continue with factor analysis. Finally, what we need is down here. It's the anti-image correlation matrix, not the anti-image covariance matrix. So we need the anti-image correlation matrix. What this is, is it looks to see if there's a correlation between the variable itself and any underlying factor. And particularly, we need the diagonals of this matrix. So we look right here, this 0.62, this 0.69, this 0.67, this 0.63, and so on. These diagonals are known as the sampling adequacy of individual items. And so what this allows us to do is for every single item, we can say, does this item sufficiently correlate with any of the underlying factors? And the way we do this is we simply say, is the value above 0.50? In this case, they all are, so 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.56, and so we include all of our data points. If we observe that any of those values are below 0 0.5, then we would actually just exclude that variable from our factor analysis and rerun everything without that variable. So just to kind of put this all on one screen so you can see the values, again, what we need is a KMO value greater than 0.6, Bartlett's test of sphericity to be significant, below 0.05, and each of our diagonals in the anti-image correlation matrix to be greater than 0.5. So now that we have confirmation that we can actually continue with factor analysis, we can try to say how many factors are there? What do we want to extract? Now there's two common ways to do this. One is to look at this table right here, the, the total variance explained in terms of eigenvalues, and the other is to use what's known as a scree plot. I'll show you the scree plot in just a moment. It's a very common tool, but I actually really don't like it. So I'll stick with this particular tool. What this table tells us is the amount of variance explained as a function of how many components or how many factors we would have. Now let's actually start at the bottom. What this tells us is that if we had six factors to represent six questions, those six factors would be able to account for 100% of all the cumulative variance. 
Well, that's no surprise, right? Six factors to explain six variables. Of course, I can explain everything. In contrast, let's go to the top. If I have only one factor, in other words, if I just took all of these variables and I just averaged across them, that one new value, that one new factor, would be able to explain 45% of all the variance that we observe in the six factors. So about half of all the variance can be explained by just one question. That's pretty good. What we want to see is how many of these factors do we need? And so we could look at the next row. This says that if I, instead of having just one factor, I somehow separated these six questions into two groups and created an average for each of those groups, I would actually be able to explain 82% of the variance. That's really good. Instead of having to think about six unique dimensions, I can only think about two dimensions and take into account 82% of all the variance that's explained. In other words, I'm giving up something like 18% of my explanatory power, but I'm gaining a tremendous amount of conceptual explanatory power because I only have to think about two dimensions rather than six. If I go up to three dimensions, I only jump a little bit. I only jump to 89%. And in fact, that's not enough. What this first column is, is the eigenvalues, which is a term for matrix algebra that we're not going to really get into in this class, which explains how much variance is actually, which account, which describes how much variance is explained by each factor. So the first factor is going to be a large amount of variance. The second factor is still large. And right away from the third factor, it drops to a much smaller amount. And the rule of thumb that we're going to use is that whenever we observe that the total eigenvalue is below one, that's where we stop in terms of the number of factors. So one factor above one, two factors above one, three factors, nope, it drops to below one, and so we hop back up and we say there are only two factors. In other words, the two-factor solution is the one that's going to give us the most conceptual explanatory power without giving up too much statistical explanatory power. So one more time, what this will tell us is that we can account for 82% of the variance, which is a lot, with only two factors. And there's not enough explanatory power gained in moving to three factors to justify doing so. And so we're going to go with a two-factor solution. For the moment, we don't need the other tables because they're actually not useful until we add a few other options. So now that we know we can perform factor analysis, and now that we know that we have two factors that need to be explained, what we can do is actually perform the factor analysis itself.